Welcome to the Sunday message from Hollyview Church in Boring, Oregon. We gather every Sunday morning as a worshiping community of Jesus followers on mission to see God glorified in our lives, our cities, and around the world. At Hollyview, the Bible serves as our foundation and guide for both life and ministry. It tells the story of God and the story of us. We believe the better we know the themes and flow of the biblical story, the better we will be able to find our little place in God's grand storyline. Thank you for joining us. And now, here's this week's message from Hollyview Church. This week, Pastor Joel is moving into the book of Ecclesiastes with the message, Seeking Joy. Ecclesiastes, one of the wisdom books. It's traditionally thought that Solomon uh, wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, mostly agreed upon, although there are some very interesting things at the beginning of Ecclesiastes in the introduction that's different than, say, Proverbs, which clearly lists Solomon uh, as its author. Uh, it's more of a general tome. It, it's kind of, uh, it's just interesting to, to notice that. Uh, Ecclesiastes really has two voices speaking at us. Two voices in, in the book of Ecclesiastes. One of them is of the preacher, and the other one is the one who's presenting the preacher's words. Um, the preacher and the one who's presenting the preacher's words. So uh, the way I think about it is, if uh, you took my manuscript of today's sermon and you went to school or work tomorrow and you said, let me tell you the words of the preacher, and you read my whole sermon, and then at the end of my sermon you said, okay, so after, after I heard all that, this is what I think. Uh, and you gave kind of a commentary at the end of it. So, so next week we'll look at the commentary of the person presenting uh, the words, but this week we're just going to consider the words of the preacher. Uh, the words of the preacher. Now in Hebrew, this word that we translate as preacher is the word koheleth, koheleth. You don't need to know that word or remember it, that's fine. Ko koheleth is the word for, for what we translate as, as preacher, and it really means one who calls an assembly together or, or speaks to a gathered group. If you translate that word koheleth, which is in, in Hebrew, into Greek, that word is ecclesiastes which is where we get the title of the book Ecclesiastes, which comes from Koheleth, Hebrew, which we translate as preacher. So the, this is the book of the, the one who gathers together to present some words to people, a preacher or, or maybe your version say even teacher or assembler or, or uh, something to that effect, the Koheleth, the Ecclesiastes. Now this preacher uh, has one long sermon over 12 chapters. Uh, he's got one theme, basically, through the whole 12 chapters, which is, we could spend a lot of time there, but we'd, we'd, there's a lot of repetition uh, in it as well. But this preacher teacher wants to get one point across, and he uses a lot of repetition in this 12 uh, chapters. We actually see that these 12 chapters are something called an inclusio, which means it has the same beginning as the, does the end. It's a narrative approach of like a bookmark, like here's the point of it. I'm going to tell you at the beginning, I'm going to tell you again, 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 and I'm going to tell you at the end what I'm talking about. So I'd like to begin the message by reading the inclusio of Ecclesiastes so we can get the theme of the words of the preacher, the Koheleth. Okay? So if you wouldn't mind, would you stand? We're going to be on page 518 of your pew Bible, 518 of your pew Bible, or Ecclesiastes 1. I'm going to read the first uh, 11 verses, and then we'll skip to the very end. Of it. Ecclesiastes 1, the words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man, man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes, a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun goes down and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the stream flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be. And what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. 
Is there a thing of which it is said, ah, see, this is new. It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. We'll stop right there. If you could jump to the end. So go to the end of Ecclesiastes in chapter 12 and verse 8. Not quite the end, because we still have the words of the commentary at the end. Uh, But 12 and verse 8, this is how he closes his sermon. He says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher. All is vanity. For 12 chapters, he wanders around this world under the sun, and he's weary, and he's tired, and he wants to give you the wisdom of how to navigate this life in the pursuit of joy among the things that we find are just vanity. Let's pray. Lord, I, I, myself, and I know people here have come weary. We live in a world that is broken and dark and lost. And Lord, uh, there are times it just feels like it's vanity. Lord, would you help us through this book to find meaning and joy that as we spend these next two weeks through this book, really clearing off the table of everything that doesn't fulfill or bring joy or bring meaning to life. Uh, as, as you kind of pry things from our hearts that, that we so desire but ultimately won't fulfill, Lord, would you do a work in each of us? So, Lord, that the things that we, we see would be clear and the things of eternity. Lord, the things that we hear would be un unfiltered that we'd get the world's voices out of us and we'd hear your voice alone. And Lord, that our heart would be called closer to you, to love you, to have our affections burn for you more than the things that you desire. So Lord, I pray in the next few minutes that you do a work in each of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go ahead and have, have a seat. Uh, before we consider these uplifting, encouraging words of Koheleth, the preacher, uh, I want to actually set up the message with, a, with an illustration to kind of help us think through uh, this. Uh, and also, it's a little bit selfish, too, because we just were on vacation this summer, and I'd like to share with you a little bit of our vacation, uh, which is normal for a preacher to do. We took our daughter, Abigail, to the place where she was born, Slovenia, uh, just a couple weeks ago, and we're reminded of the beauty of that country. So I, I just want to give you a little uh, tourist guide of Slovenia, if you don't mind. I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, there's a picture here of Lake Bled, uh, which is one of the most beautiful places in the world. Anyone been there? I think you need to go there. It's beautiful. You can ask Tanya or Brady. Like, it's a beautiful place. Super old. It's got a little island with a church on it, some stairs leading up. In the background, you can see, is a thousand-year-old castle. Uh, the Alps are surrounding it. I mean, it's, it's the place of, like, fairy tales. Uh, you can walk around the lake. It's just absolutely beautiful. So if you look up Slovenia, even online, Google it, you'll get a picture of Lake Bled, because it's, it's amazing there. Uh, well, if you go from the Alps and you go anywhere else, it's beautiful, go all the way to the coast. It's, it's right on the Adriatic Sea, and there's this little town called Piran, which we have another picture of. Uh, oh, is that beautiful? It's one of the most beautiful, sorry, that's one of the most beautiful uh, towns in Europe. I think it's like in the top 15 beautiful towns in all of Europe uh, on some list. Who comes up with those lists? I don't know. Uh, but it's, it's absolutely beautiful, and in fact, you just take those, the mountains to the coastline, and it's beautiful everywhere. Everywhere you go, it's, it's just beautiful. It's uh, not only beautiful, it's very safe. Violent crime there is almost non-existent. Uh, they are super educated people, very, very knowledgeable. Everybody speaks English. Uh, they, they borrowed from the Austrians, so they sweep the roads. Everything is super uh, clean. They have flowers over everywhere. They're very successful. They did great after the fall of communism. They're the number one GDP uh, Eastern European, Central European bloc country. They've just excelled in everything, which makes it so ironic then that when we lived there and for several years later that it ranked among the highest in the world in suicides. 
They have everything you could want. I mean, can you imagine living in Lake Bled? I mean, you're living in a fairy tale. You're educated. You're, you're motivated. You can freedom to travel wherever you want to go. Everything they want. And yet suicide, there was this underbelly and darkness of, uh, it was like they had everything available to them and they were like, we don't have any joy or, or hope. Even the Slovene Times, which is their news, newspaper, said uh, this of the, uh, just really the epidemic of suicide um, about 10 years ago. It said, every foreigner who comes to Slovenia and sees its natural beauty says, we live in a paradise. And then it had gone over all these statistics of suicides. He says, but, but, but judging by these statistics, we have a proper hell residing in our souls. What's going on? Now, sometimes it's easy to uh, step away and see somebody from, from outside, but I think the same question applies to us here. You, you can have everything you want. It's, it's all laid out for you. But we can't find happiness, contentment, or meaning. So I want you to imagine with me uh, this, a large table, like a banquet table that someone set out. And they actually do these now, these grazing tables. Picture something like a grazing table that's beautifully decorated. And it has everything you could ever want on that table. I mean, not just food. I'm talking uh, money, piles of money, deeds to mansions or, or keys to car, any car you want. It has a, a crown there that you could become your own king or queen. You could, you could be a ruler. You could do whatever you want, food, pleasure. Everything's on this table. And the host comes up to you and says, come, enjoy. Take anything you want. Whatever your heart's desire, whatever you think will bring you happiness and joy and meaning, take anything. And you step up to that table. And I mean... A moment of like euphoria, all this stuff is out there for you to grab. But you only have two hands. You have to choose. So you reach out. I'm just going to take some piles of money because that can get me lots of things. And you reach out your hand for the pile of money, but once you grab that money, it like just crumbles like sand in your hand so that you bring back a hand and you've got nothing. So you, so you wipe it off. You go, okay, I'm going to reach out for education, diplomas. And you reach out your hand, and as soon as you grab it, it just crumbles again. I mean, over and over, you reach out your hand and grab something, and it just crumbles in front of you, so you have nothing. If you did this over and over and over again, of course, you, you would be frustrated and, and empty and without hope. Well, we're given a short time on this earth. And the question that the preacher is exploring is, how are you going to use it? What satisfies? What, what brings joy or meaning in life? And that's a question we all ask as well. Well, this brings us back to Ecclesiastes and the journey of the preacher for the quest to find joy in this life under the sun. He searches everywhere. I mean, 12 chapters, and he has everything on the table, and he searches everywhere that he calls life under the sun, under the sun. That's a, a repeated phrase, under the sun, which basically means anything that the sun touches, that's where I've explored. You, you can imagine anything on this world he's going to explore. So today, I just want to... Uh, I want to bring us through the message, and here's kind of the, the outline of what we'll, we'll do. First, we're going to uh, see the preacher's quest. So we're going to follow this pre preacher's quest to find joy. And, and then, he's, then we're going to uh, go off a little bit. He finds something called vanity, or, or we'll look at a Hebrew word called hevel, uh, and see what it's like to, to pursue joy in, in the vanity or the hevel of life. And then finally, uh, it'll encourage all of us to clear off the table. To, to prepare, and we'll, we'll work through those. The preacher's quest, the pursuit of hevel, and the pursuit in hevel, and then the clearing off of the table. So here's the first one, the preacher's quest to find joy. He looks everywhere over the 12 chapters, and at the end of 12 chapters, he comes up empty. 
he uses this phrase, under the sun. He actually uses it 32 times, if you underline it in Ecclesiastes. 32 times he'll use, and this is what I found, under the, the sun. He has, he's looked everywhere the sun touches, all the extremes. He looks in his bank account. He looks for love. He looks for boyfriend, girlfriends, cars, vacations, titles, education, pleasure, death itself, life, everything he looks for for meaning and joy, and he says it's vanity. So let me just, let's just follow. I just want to show you uh, four of these, and then we'll kind of list some other ones. Here, here's the first place. He's like, if anything else would bring meaning and joy in life, it's got to be your work, your career. I mean, that's where you spend most of your time. So get busy. Fill your time. Build the tallest buildings you can build. Surely that would leave a mark. Cure cancer. Surely that would bring meaning and joy. Put your hands to work, build bridges and houses, or be a teacher, instruct other things, sell things, buy things, work or career. It seems like it's got to be some kind of meaning or fulfillment in life. And this is what he says in Ecclesiastes 2.11. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil that I had expended in doing them, and behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind. And there was nothing to be gained under the sun. And we often uh, talk about we give 110% at work. And then at home, we're kind of like, oh, we'll give 80 or 90%. Uh, because I think we think that in our careers or our works, we'll make something of ourselves, we'll make an impact in this world. And so we pour our lives into it. And uh, the preacher here goes, look, I poured my life into it, and I still think I reached out and grabbed it, and it crumbled in my hands. It's vanity. So education. Here's the next one. Education. So maybe it's not what you do, right? Maybe it's what you know. Uh, maybe the more and more like skills and understanding and degrees, maybe the more books you read will actually satisfy you. Maybe if there's just one book you could read, that would, and then everything would come... And it, Everything would come to place. You'd be joy and it'd be meaning. There, maybe you just need more information. Ecclesiastes 2.18. He says, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool. Yet he will be master of all which I toiled and use my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. You can use all your wisdom in the world, but in the end... Vanity. How about justice? It seems like if we could just get to the place where there would be law and order and retribution and justice and everything would be as it should be, harmony in our world, maybe then we would find joy. Ecclesiastes 4, verse 1. Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. And on the side of the oppressor, there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. The oppressed and the oppressor. They're, they didn't find meaning or joy in either of them. If you take the oppressed and make them the oppressor, they will not find any more comfort in that. If you take the marginalized and give them places of power, that will not bring meaning or satisfaction. It will still be corrupt. There's no amount of laws we could make in this country that you could reach out and go, I finally am at peace. You can make the neglected the king or the president or the queen, and that would still never satisfy. It's not in work. It's not in education. It's not in justice. It's not in money. Here's the fourth one. You think, if I just had enough money, th then life would be great. Ecclesiastes 4, 7 says, Again, I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no, no other either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil, and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, for whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This is also vanity and an unhappy business. It's not money that will get us there. He doesn't find joy or meaning there either. The preacher searches everywhere, anywhere the sun touches, and he doesn't find joy. He just finds vanity. I want you to look at this list that I've made. Uh, it's not an exhaustive list, but it's an exhausting list. I want to read it to just feel everywhere you reach out to grab for meaning and joy and that crumbles under you. Uh, there's pleasure. There's work. 
There's wisdom, there's heritage, inheritance, work and rest, reward for your work. Death doesn't satisfy. Envy, loneliness, remembrance, dreams, money. Not like enjoyment, but what about stoicism and no enjoyment at all? That doesn't satisfy. Darkness and appetite, it's never craved. Words, they all seem to crumble as well. Life, laughter of fools, life and death, death of the worshiping man even. The results from your work, your life itself, all that comes to you, your youth, and on and on it goes. And he ends with, everything is vanity. How are you feeling, church? <laughs> well, uh, I think the preacher gets to the end of his life and goes, this is a weary and toilsome thing. So I want to I want to give wisdom and perspective to those who come after me, that I, I can give them some, some wisdom on how to navigate this world. Because what I found in all of those things is I found vanity. So let's look at our second thing, the pursuit of hevel or vanity. He, conc he concludes that everything that his hand has reached out to grasp has crumbled and is vanity. Now, uh, there's, some of your versions might say meaningless. Uh, vanity is not like the vanity mirror that's in the, you know, they like, ooh, I look... Okay, it's not like how you look. It's an old English word that's, that it means the, it's the quality of worthlessness. It means it's, it's not worth anything. Uh, but I actually think that doesn't quite get to the root of the meaning either. So I want to teach you a Hebrew word. And this isn't to, uh, to like make me look great. This is to give you a tool so that you can even share with people hevel. Hevel. Uh, there's, this is the Hebrew word hevel. Hevel means... Uh, and try to put all these together in one. It means breath, vanity, or the quality of worthlessness, idols, vapor, or smoke. So breath, worthlessness, idols, vapor, or smoke. The word is hevel. That word is hard to describe in English. What is all those compact together. What do, what do idols and breath have in common? What do vapor and smoke have in common? Well, in Hebrew, it's hevel. Hevel. It's a hard word to describe, but I think it's hard to describe on purpose. I think the preacher knows this word is so elusive, and he says, it's hevel. It's like smoke from a candle. Like, you light a candle, and you put it out, and what do you see afterwards? You see this the smoke that kind of dances in front of you. You look at it, it's really there. It might even like curl and make some kind of like, oh, that looks like a heart. It's there. You know it's there. It has meaning. But as soon as you reach out to grab smoke from a candle that's been extinguished, what happens? Just gone. Hevel. You see it. It's right there. You know it's you know it's right there. It's not in a, it's not in your imagination. Reach out to grab it and it, you get nothing. Hevel. Hevel. When our kids were little, we used to they used to like play with kinetic sand. You know what kinetic sand is? It's if you're a little bit older, we didn't have kinetic sand. We just had the old sandbox with the cat stuff in it. Uh, <laughs> you know, if you're old enough, you know. Uh, but our kids had kinetic sand, which was really cool sand that has, like, it stays consistently, like, kind of wet a little bit so you can shape it. And our kids would make all these uh, meals and foods because we had these like, things they could pack them into. Uh, and sometimes we watch those food shows, you know, where they're judging food. And so our kids would make these uh, meals, and they, they would present them, like, oh, yes, I've made a tri-tip steak with a side of salad, and uh, dessert would be whatever. Uh, and they would come judge it to us. And you look at them and you're like, oh, those look great. They look really good. The moment you touch one of those things, if you know, if you've ever seen kinetic sand, the moment you touch that thing, it just crumbles. It looks, it looks real. There's something there. But the moment you try to grab it or control it or take ownership of it, it's gone. We'd say kinetic sand is hevel. It's hevel. Well, the experience of the preacher on his journey to find joy in this life under the sun, he ends up and goes, it's all hevel. It's not that it's meaningless. It's just that I can't control it. I can't take it for my own. Uh, 
it's this elusive thing that, that I, I see it's there and I reach out and it's just gone. So now what? Everything you explore is vanity, hevel, worthlessness. So what do we do now? I mean, that's pretty hopeless. But that's the reason that the preacher has preached this sermon. He wants to help us to clear off our tables, to clear off the tables. He's explored all of life under the sun and found it all to be hevel. Uh, and I think that's all of our experiences as well, isn't it? There are other times where you're like, boy, if I just had this, it would satisfy. And as soon as you grab it, it crumbles, and you're like, oh, that doesn't satisfy. And so we reach out to grab something else that satisfies. Because actually, we see that person over there reaching out to grab it, so that must mean it satisfies. So then you reach out to grab that, and it's hevel, and that, and it's hevel. And so we live in this life under the sun, always reaching for hevel over and over, and the, the preacher wants us to stop and just consider. What, what are you reaching out for? Maybe there's uh, something that you're missing. So the book of Ecclesiastes, actually, uh, many people are like, boy, it's such a downer of a book, which maybe by this point you guys are all depressed. And, uh, but that's not the intent of Ecclesiastes. E Ecclesiastes is set, uh, set up to be something uh, called negative theology. Negative theology which means it's not adding to something, it's actually taking something away. It's saying, you don't want that, you don't want that. Its role is removing all the things that aren't going to satisfy, to clear off the table before a meal. I don't know about you and your house, but I'm guessing it's so. Uh, our dining room table during a week long of activities and sports and school becomes a dumping ground of places. Is this like your table at all? Homework, uh, crafts, um, there's sometimes there's even like, we, we clean it though, but like socks, like how do <laughs> socks get on? That? But there's just stuff that piles up on that table. And, and before we eat a meal together, we say, hey, we need to clear off the table, which all our kids are like, yes, my favorite job. <laughs> no, nobody, nobody likes clearing off the table. It's like, it's like, oh, this is... I don't even know where this goes because clearing off the table actually forces you to decide, are we going to keep this A on the spelling test or are we going to throw it away? Uh, it, it forces you to do something with it and put things in its proper uh, place. And usually, and probably in the same as every house, as you're clearing off the table, you'll hear somebody uh, yell out, I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm hungry. And you're like, yeah. Finish clearing off the table so that you can eat. The purpose of clearing off the table is so that you can eat. Ecclesiastes is a book that is calling all of you to come and clear off the table because there's something for you to eat that's going to satisfy. Come and clear off the table. Now, of course, all those like homework and socks and all that stuff represent all those things in life that are on offer to you. Education, power, money, security, pleasure, success, importance, all of everything on that table. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the preacher is saying, come to the table. Let's begin to clear that stuff off. Because really what you're longing for is something way more. Maybe you are, are tired of reaching out and thinking, boy, if we just got justice in this case. Then it would finally satisfy, and it just crumbles. Maybe, maybe you're thinking, boy, if I just had 500 more dollars on my bank account, then we could like breathe easy and have meaning and joy, and it just crumbles. Uh, maybe it's relationships. If we just had this relationship right, then everything would be right. Money, success, security, pleasure, whatever it is, the preacher goes, stop. Just stop. Let's clear off the table. So really, as a Christian, the only thing worth holding on to, reaching out and grabbing hold of, is Jesus. It's the only thing that will satisfy. Uh, there's always this hope of, what about the next thing? But the preacher goes, look, I've explored it all, and I want to tell you, it's, it's hevel. The only thing that will bring joy and purpose and meaning in life is found at holding on to the cross of Christ. 
is found in Jesus. Listen as Jesus tells us this as well. John 6 and verse 27. He says, Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. For on him God the Father has set his seal. Then they said to him, What must we do? Where do we reach out and grab to, to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered him, This is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but your father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then he said to, they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. That brings us to a point, church, to ask, what are you reaching your hand out for? What are you striving after? What are you thinking if I just get there, and you're, and you're just frustrated, and you just can't seem to get there. Maybe you're, you're just drowning in shopping lists from Amazon, the endless clicking, the endless looking on TikTok or YouTube, and you're just never satisfied. Well, maybe this week you don't need to add something to your calendar. Maybe you need to start taking things away. Maybe you need to just spend some uh, time in peace, praying to God, reaching out for his words, reading the Bible, just quieting your hearts. Well, next week, we're going to come back to this and hear the commentator as he uh, gives us a summary of what to do with the preacher's words. And we're going to see that he, he's basically going to say, it's not what you achieve in this life, it's what you receive. It's not what you do, it's not what you reach out and grasp for, it's actually what you open your hands to receive. And a lot of those things are the same things. He says, and, and in that posture, you'll find joy and meaning and hope and life as he changes our perspective. So don't go away this week depressed. <laughs> Come back next week, uh, and, and hopefully uh, even the, the perspective of Ecclesiastes will allow you some freedom even this next week. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for the word. Um, and Lord, we all are just like the preacher. We live in this life under the sun. So help us to navigate it well. Help us to not... Um, Reach out to things that won't ultimately satisfy or bring joy or meaning in life. Let us uh, continually be reminded to go back to you. That we would clear off our tables so that we could, uh, we could eat from you the bread of life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.